name is Stephanie Stone. I'm Chief Deputy for LA County's Department of Military and Veteran Affairs, and I'm a 20-year Navy vet. And today I'm sitting here with Jeannie Buchanan. Jeannie, can you introduce yourself? My name is Jeannie Buchanan. I'm a U.S. Army veteran, and I served 1975 to 1978 uh, in the Military Police Corps was one of the first women allowed into that MOS. And we've been asked to have an we have an opportunity to, to talk today. And so I just want to start by saying that we're really good friends now. Really good friends. But we didn't meet that long ago. Do you remember when we met? I'm going to say, okay, a little bit before Christmas. So right. it's not even that long, right. a couple of months. Right. And then we met, we met for a Christmas party, actually. Well, you called me up. I had no idea who you were. Yeah. And you, you told me that. My name's Stephanie Stone. Yes, yeah. and all of my staff has met you and done things with you and think you're fabulous yeah. and I need to meet you. I will pick you up at 8. We're going out. So, I and, said, we oh, and we did. We, did. we went out to the American Legion post. We right? certainly did. did yeah. Celebrate. I think it was Veterans of Media and Entertainment. Yeah. We did a yeah. did a vote, and that's where you got that hat. You got me this awesome yeah. hat. Yes. But how is it that my staff got to meet you before I did? Oh, okay. Um, I have terminal cancer, and so there's an organization called Dreamers Organization, kind of like Make a Wish for Children, but yeah. for adults. Yeah. And so I applied as a veteran and said what my dream was. And um, that was the Dream Foundation? Is dream it, Foundation? Am I saying? Uh -huh. yeah, dr yeah, Dream Foundation. And what was your dream? Well, and it really was a place I had always wanted to go the Langham Hotel, Spa and Resort, just because I live downtown and it's so noisy and I love nature. I'm from Connecticut. And I just wanted to go somewhere where it was beautiful, quiet, and serene. The luxury was secondary to me, but I kind of liked the luxury once I got there. Because they upgraded me to a two-bedroom suite, and it was just an amazing weekend. And it was a Dream Foundation that actually connected our And office. they said, hey, we have a female vet. Yeah. And then you guys decided, yeah. you, you started calling networks and saying, hey, we'd like you to meet this. Lady. Yeah. And I didn't even know this. I didn't even know. It was, it was fabulous. And then, you, and then took, I called up. you took me under your wing. Well, it was a it was a situation where I'd heard about, I heard all about you, and I saw oh, I got yeah, to see I hadn't you. met you yet. No, That's I hadn't right. met you. And I and I saw I saw you posting on on the news. Oh, that's and right. I saw who you were. Yes. And here's this person that is supposedly critical with cancer, right. and yet you were so upbeat, as you were yeah, now. Yeah, you wouldn't now. think yeah. to look at me. So there was an event that night we went out. Yes. And and you stayed out pretty late, as a matter of fact. I thought, <laughs> oh, an hour at the most. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no. But you also told me that night of something else you were doing, and that's what... Okay, so that evening you told me about this, about Christmas. this tradition that you hold right. every Christmas. What is it that you and do? I never told anyone that it did it. I'd been doing it for three years and it was just something, which I'll explain, that I chose to do. And the reason I didn't tell anybody, I didn't want it to sound like I was bragging. Right. Oh, aren't I wonderful? Right. So, I actually was homeless. For I'm very familiar with the homeless population down there and then I, I was working at the time, thank God, so I oh. saved up my money and I ended up getting a little apartment on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And then I started noticing the people that live in the street, right. not in the shelters, right. barefoot, nothing, wet piece of cardboard to sleep on. And I would go to my window at night and go to close the curtain and see these people setting up there. I couldn't stand it. Yeah. So um, I started collecting things throughout the year. Uh, when I saw stuff on sale, you, believe it or not, socks, right. shoes, blankets, uh, treats, I mean, any uh, chapstick, just things that you wouldn't think of. These are people with just the shirt on their back, if they have a shirt. Um, goodie bags and food, and I can't remember what else I had in my, my car. Everybody eats, because I live next to Carl's Jr. 
and so I would feed everybody. So I'd get up super early before, there's these guys they call the green shirts on yep. the bikes and yes. they wake everybody up. Safety patrols, yeah. So I'd be out there early before everybody left and I'd wake them up and go, hey, it's Christmas. Give out all my stuff and feed everybody. So I did that for three years by myself and for some reason I told you about it. Yeah. Yeah. So you told me about this tradition. Right. Yeah. I invited myself to join you this you year. You did. Along with a friend of yours. Yes, she came yeah. too. And I was an anthropology crew again. You're like the most popular woman. I, I know my phone rang. We're like, hey, can you get down to the lobby? It was five. Yeah. For a lie, uh, no. Could you come down six for a film? Yes, I can. Yeah. So I and have, it was so sweet. Oh. The Shopping cart. shopping cart, all decorated, full of jingle socks. bells, socks and blankets and chapsticks and oh, little flashlights for the ladies, toiletries. What was your, what was the? What I had one, one special gift. Uh, when I when I got cancer and I started to lose my my hair, I thought wigs because we're gonna have to wear them. And I bought this wig and I didn't like it and I decided hats was gonna be the way to go. Yeah. And I saved it. And I thought, this is the perfect day. Yeah. I am going to bring this beautiful $200 wig, and I'm going to find somebody and make, and make their day. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't till the very end. Absolutely. We'd gone all around, gave everything away, fed everybody, and we headed towards Skid Row a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And there was this young girl just sitting like this. Can I take you back just a bit? Oh, yeah. Just right before that time, we had been on another corner right across from her. Yeah. And we were surrounded by men oh. giving out tap cards from Metro That's and food right. cards from the I Red Cross. I forgot about the food cards. And yeah. they were all there, but she didn't come. She didn't come. And you went to her. I went to her. She was all alone. Yeah. There was just something, and she was yeah. young. She couldn't have been over 18. Yeah, she was really young. Yeah. So I walked mm -hmm. over to her, and I said, Hi, oh, you know, Merry Christmas. How are you feeling? I don't think she really said too much. I said, Listen, honey, do you wear wigs? And she goes, I don't know how to put one on. Yeah. Well, here came Tracy. It was both of you. Well, yeah, she, she had followed me over, <laughs> who wears, you know, knows everything about hair accessories. And she goes, I'll show you. And that just made my heart feel so good, so... No, this was only the second time you and I had ever spent time together. I know. So let's take, let's move okay. back a little bit. Okay. So one of the things that connected with us is the fact that we're both veterans, right? Right. So tell me about your Veterans Day. When, Veteran Day, when did, when did you join? I went in at May of 75. Where were you stationed? Uh, uh, Gelnhausen, Germany, Ooh. which you probably haven't heard of. No. The platoon <laughs> was there. The company was in Hanau and the battalion was in Frankfurt, so near Frankfurt. Okay. So we were all kind of split out. And you said something in the beginning that you were one of the first. Right, not so the first. I can't remember what year the wax were abolished. I think it was 72 or 73, something like that. 75. 70, oh, so I went in the very year uh, where they allowed, they changed us to service members. Mm -hmm. And they opened up MOS jobs to women that weren't allowed to do it. And that was exactly what I wanted. I didn't want to do a stereotypical woman's job, nothing against it. Mm -hmm. But military police get to be one of the first women, sign me up. You were one of the first or the first in your platoon? One of the first. Or when I got to my platoon, there were two, we all kind of came at the same time. There, there was another genie. And another young lady who I, I don't remember. So there were, there were three of us that all kind of sort of came at the same time. And um, <laughs> I remember the cafeteria I'm going to tell you about. I have a story about the cafeteria. The very first day I was in my full uniform, you know, with my everything, you know, my belt, my gun, the whole thing. Big, huge cafeteria. I walk in with a couple of guys in my platoon, and everyone froze. I mean, guys were like, <laughs> and I was like, 
looking around going, OMG. I said, I'm going to have to write my mother tonight. She may never see me again. I was like so overwhelmed. Well, how did the men treat you? Well, they were just shocked. Okay. You know. Initially. Initially, they were shocked, but then the guys were like, come on. Um, and I went and got something to eat. My platoon basically took me in and kind of put the word out, this is one of ours. Yeah, she's a woman, but she's, she's one of ours. So that helped a lot. Yeah. And I told my platoon, my whole unit, I said, listen, I know I'm not a man. You know, we use our mind right. a little bit more. Right. And so I'll, you you'll see, yeah, me. you'll see, I'll yeah. handle a situation different, and it did happen. I mean, we'd be driving, well, back in the day, quarter ton Jeeps, that's what we were in, mm -hmm. and say guys were smoking weed or something, we'd pull them over. When I talk to them, yes ma'am, no ma'am, where the guys will throw them up on the Jeep. So, the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's situations like that, mm -hmm. but they put it out there that I was mm -hmm. a member of the unit and I was going to be respected and treated just like, you know, they were. Sounds like you love the military. Best decision I ever made in my life. I traveled all over Central Europe, made some wonderful friends. It was just the best thing I ever did as a young person. What made you leave? To join the Army? No, yeah. what made you leave the oh. military? Did you just do your four years and decide to come out? Or what was, were there other things that were part of it, contributed to that decision? Well, okay, when I was in training in Fort McClellan, Alabama, that's where the military police school was then. Not there now, I don't even know Fort McClellan is still there. But while I was there, I was raped mm -hmm. by two uh, non-commissioned officers. And the situation was, I went to their billets, I knew I shouldn't be there, they knew I shouldn't be there, and I knew if I got caught or reported it, I would be thrown out of the Army. Mm -hmm. So, I ended up making the decision, I did tell, I mean, I told a friend, um, but back in those days, in the 70s, I, even if I had reported it, they wouldn't have done anything and they would have put me out and I wanted to be in the Army. So sometimes I regret the decision because that was my integrity, you know. Uh, but other times I'm glad that I stuck it out because I got to have the good experience mm -hmm. that I had in the military um, and everything that I learned and experienced. However, if anything like that were to ever happen to me again, I don't care what was at stake, I would report and fight and fight. And Great. And how long has it been since you've been out? Well, I got out of the regular army in 78, okay. but then when Desert Storm came along, okay. I saw all those mothers going in and leaving their babies. I'm like, I've got to at least go back in the reserves. I can't. I, I just felt like I had to support, you know, the, yeah. what was happening. So, uh, Los Alamitos, yeah. a couple, I think two, three years of reserves down there. No. And that was it. Did you ever have any repercussions because of the experience? The oh, experience? Yes, I mean, totally stuffed it. Yeah. You know, and went on, and um, I got PTSD uh, from it. I didn't know that right. that's what I had, right. but let, let me tell you this experience. When the movie The General's Daughter came out, I went and saw that movie and had a breakdown, <laughs> but, it, but it was good. It got me to, I'll get to that part. I just sat there, I, I, I couldn't even move out of my seat, 
because it happened in Fort McClellan. It happened where it happened to me. I didn't get tied down like she did. It wasn't exactly like that. Mm -hmm. But then the father coming and telling her, the general, not to report it. I mean, I was just sitting in the theater, reliving the whole thing. I literally staggered out of the theater. So here it is. Now I got to deal with it because yeah. it's all it's up. And and um, I went to uh, Prescott, Arizona, VA. Day, <laughs> you've been going to the VA and getting health care benefits or health care services, but you've never applied for your benefits. I didn't know. I thought it had to be service connected. I didn't know you could get benefits. That, now I'm a hundred percent disabled because of my cancer. Right. I didn't know. Yeah. So if I didn't have you, my, my new bestie, <laughs> I, <laughs> I would never have known. Yeah. So well, we're getting you we're getting me we're we're getting me going. I met Fantastic. Chris and right. he started he's gonna come and see me. Which are it's our veteran service service uh, officer that's gonna Oh yeah, and he's help on it. On he we had a meeting and he's gonna come and see me out at the hospice. And part of Part of your health care now is going over to the VA hospice care? Yeah, I'm, I, yes, I'm switching. I was with a private carrier, but I, I'm switching to the VA completely for my care. Why? Uh, for one, it's completely free. That's yeah. the main reason. Yeah. And I was not going to be able to have anywhere to live. My disability was running out. Yeah. You've actually out, outlived. But why? Well, I, I, I would have ended up homeless. I, I was going to only be left with my Social Security, $1,100. Who can live on that and pay for private insurance? And so I... I'm taking a step back because when you and I first met, you had shared something with me then. You weren't expected to live until... <gasps> That's the thing. They had only, yeah, in April, one to six at best. Yeah. And it's a year. Six months. One six, to six months. months. So it's been a year, and here I am. <laughs> still dancing. Still dancing. And um, so th the nice thing about the, the VA hospice is there's no limit. Mm -hmm. If I, that's supposed to be one to three months. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, they can only really guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that makes me feel good. As long as I live, I can live there. How were you diagnosed with cancer? I mean, what was it that? I, for many years, thought I had some type of bowel disorder, like IBS or colitis. You know, I diagnosed mm -hmm. myself, like mm -hmm. we all like do. Like I was going to say. And then two years ago, I realized I was very sick. And I knew, you know, my symptoms, Jeannie, this isn't IBS anymore. You, mm -hmm. I knew I can't, I yeah. knew. So I arranged for the, uh, colonoscopy and the tumor was so big they couldn't even use a pediatric needle to it. When they brought me out, they, I said, how long was I in there? And they went like this, nine minutes. And I knew. Yeah. But it was okay. You know me. I snapped right into yeah, action. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what I want to figure out. It's like, out. all right, I have cancer. Yeah. Well, well let's, let's, you know, get online, get information, yeah. call the American Cancer Society. Where do I go? They're fabulous. Yeah. You tell them what your needs are, and they'll send you an email with like 20 links to places to get anything. That was my first start, and um, I got hooked up with what they call buddies, other people that are going through uh, uh, cancer. But to, to shorten the story, I chose not to do the treatment. It was going to be a year long of this horrendous surgery of removing things that weren't going to be replaced and radiation and chemo and I've never been a believer in any of it. But I tried it for a week mm -hmm. and after one week I said I'm not doing this. Well this is the genie I know. Right. I've always been very enthusiastic. Very yeah. Tough, but also very proactive. Yeah. I was so the radiation chemo and the sur it was not for me. Mm -hmm. I I woke up one morning and I prayed about it and thought about it and cried about it and I said I'm not going to do it. This is not for me. But I wanted to talk to someone about it. Um, I have a 
relationship with God. Now I'm talking to a man of cloth. So I went to the Kaiser chaplain. He saw me right away. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is what has happened to me, and I don't want to do it. And he said, it's just your body anyway. I mean, and we had this great conversation. Yeah. And I said, but I don't know what to do. What's going to happen to me? He goes, you've got hospice. I go, what's that? He goes, we'll send people to your home. I go, you're kidding me. He, How do I do it? And he said, just go see your primary care provider. Before I got home, I got a phone call. It was supposed yeah. to take weeks. Yeah. That day, a nurse was there signing me in. And so for the last year, on the weekdays, I have a nurse, spiritual advisor, a social worker, a doctor, so five, five days a week, someone would come, yeah. and if if outside of that I needed help, I could call that, um, like a call center of nurses in the middle of the night if I had questions, but I didn't really utilize that. They became my family. I said goodbye to my nurse today. It was hard. She's. I called her my ninja nurse. <laughs> her name was Min, and um, they were really great, really yeah. great. And um, but I was lonely. So you're going to be transitioning. Yeah, to a and I was. Family. Yeah, yeah, and I wanted to be around people. And on the weekends there was nobody. And on the weekends I was the sickest. Seemed like. Yeah. And when I realized I had to find some place, or I was going to be homeless. Yeah. You know, I right away. We had a discussion, I right away got it on the internet, and called the VA. Into a new location with a right. new set of supporters. Supporters and, and everything. And we're still here. And um, you're still here, here of course. We're still here. Um, but you know your time is, is coming to an end soon, right? You know, I have felt that way sometimes, but to be honest with you, not really. Right now. And, I, and I'll tell you why. If I had bought into that in the very beginning, oh, I'm going to die, I only have six months, I chose not to accept that. Yeah. And I have a close relationship with God, and I'm a very positive person, and I believe that the way that I've lived my life, still being giving, and caring more about other people's problems than my own cancer, yep. that positive energy is real and it's I healing. <laughs> and I don't really know when, when God wants to take me, but I'm not feeling like one to three months is in my cards right now. I, I think I have longer than that. You ready for another Christmas? I, oh my God, if we could have another Christmas, that would be <laughs> like the best. I love it, it really would. That would be a nice go. goal to have. Absolutely. One more Christmas. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love you. <laughs>